Pay read to us earlier on on the video. Micah chapter 6. Uh, we're thinking this afternoon the title, What Does the Lord Require of You? Let me pray one more time and then we'll listen to what God might say to us today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for how you're described in the book of Micah as being the Lord of all the earth. Thank you for your majesty, for your awesome power. We pray you'd help us to come to you this afternoon uh, humbly to hear what you might say to us. Give us ears to hear. Help us, we pray, as we uh, navigate these uh, unusual days to have our confidence fully in you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Something about these words that really resonates, isn't there? I guess they speak to our deep sense of justice. What's right, what's wrong, what's fair, what's reasonable. We're passionate about these kinds of things, aren't we, as people, as, as a society? In recent days, there have been the debates about child poverty. We've all seen it on the news, sparked by Marcus Rashford, his own experience growing up, and the, the debates that have come out of that. Uh, of course, there have been very different views about how to address the issue, but very few have been saying the issue doesn't matter. We believe in justice. How can it be right when many of us have more than enough? But others in a nation as wealthy as ours are struggling to feed the kids during the holidays. That's not fair. As we continue to wrestle as a nation with how to handle the coronavirus as we enter a second lockdown on Thursday, it's throwing up all sorts of questions, isn't it, about justice in our own lives. People are feeling the impact on their livelihoods and their leisure time. And we hear these words time after time in the debates and amongst the pundits, it's just not fair. Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. We're drawn to those words, aren't we, because of our innate sense of justice. But there's another reason why these words are so compelling to us, and it's this. You see, these words are the answer to one of the most fundamental questions that everyone in our world asks at some point in their lives. Take a look again at the verse in its entirety. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God? You see, these profound words are the answer to a profound question. What does the Lord require of you? In other words, what does God want from me? What can I do to please him? What can I sacrifice to satisfy him? What ritual can I perform to appease him? What good can I do to placate him? That is to turn away his anger. It will come up with all sorts of different answers to that question, but the question is there for all of us. Maybe it's a question on your mind this afternoon. Let's briefly look at four things from this passage. First, the big question, what does God want? What does he want from us? Let's just pause and find our feet for a minute in the Bible. Where are we? What's going on in the context here? Well, God is speaking to his people through his prophet Micah, who is sent to the two big cities of the day, Jerusalem and Samaria. We're told why he's sent in chapter 3, verse 8, to declare to Jacob his transgressions, to Israel his sin. Micah hasn't got an easy job, has he? Pointing out the faults and the failings of God's people. This is all happening about 100 years before the Babylonians or Babylonians will sweep into the southern kingdom, take God's people into exile. During Micah's lifetime, he will see the northern kingdom attacked by the Assyrians who will come in and take control. So there we are. That's the, the backdrop to what's going on here in the book of Micah. And so we come to this question, what does God want? Well, of course, he articulates something of an answer there in chapter 6, verse 8. But before we get to these kind of famous words, we've got to see God really wants something much more basic, something much more simple from his people. There are three sections in the book of Micah, if you study this book, three distinct sections, and each section begins with exactly the same word. You can find it if you want to look later in chapter 1, verse 2, in chapter 3, verse 1, and chapter 6, verse 1. Take a look at chapter 6. It's probably open before you there. The first verse says, listen to what the Lord says. See, in each of the three sections of Micah, we see that 
he speaks of a terrible judgment that's to come, but also an incredible salvation. And if the people who hear this prophecy are going to understand anything of this, well, they've got to respond to the most basic command first, to listen, simply to listen to God, to hear his words. So here's the first challenge for us this afternoon. Friends, are we simply ready to listen to God? Do we come with a sense of anticipation before his word, with a willingness to humble ourselves before him, to listen to what he's going to say to us? Maybe some of you are sitting there thinking, well, why should we? Plenty of people outside this church building right now saying, why not what I want to? Listen to God. Isn't God's word a total irrelevance these days? Striking, wasn't it, last night as the Prime Minister shared the list of activities impacted by the new lockdown, there was no mention at all in the speech about places of worship, was there? No mention. You had to wait till the announcement came out in more, in more detail later that evening, look down, further down the list, and there it is. Why is that? Well, who knows for sure, but maybe because most of society sees the gathering of Christian people at a total irrelevance. Why would they make a point of mentioning it? And so therefore, why would we bother listening to God with such devotion and such seriousness? I wonder, do you know what the name Micah means? The name Micah really is a question. Who is like the Lord? The great claim of the Bible is that there is no other God like him. He is the Lord of all the earth. Chapter 4, verse 13. Therefore, when he speaks, he he demands a listener. He has all authority, all power. Here is a God who knows, who who sees, who intervenes. And so, friends, we must listen to him. We've got to hear him on his terms, not our own terms. What does God want? Well, yes, chapter 6, verse 8, he does want us to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly before him. But most fundamentally, the book of Micah says he wants us simply to listen to him. What does God want? Second, what have we done? We hear what God wants, but what have we done? It's a horrible feeling, isn't it, to be told you've not quite met the grade or you've failed to make the mark. I guess at some point in life most of us have experienced that. Maybe it's uh, opening the rejection letter after a job interview or sitting in the driving test center after the event somewhat despondently. Even worse, isn't it, in those moments when we thought we'd done enough to to make the mark, to pass the test. We thought things were going to be okay. God's people in the day of Micah were in for this kind of shock. They thought everything was just fine between them and God. After all, they were God's chosen people, weren't they? So what did they say? Chapter 3, verse 11, we read these words. Her leaders judge for a bribe. Her priests teach for a price. And her prophets tell fortunes for money. Yet they look for the Lord's support and say, is not the Lord among us? No disaster will come upon us. They thought they were secure. They thought, what could possibly go wrong? We can live how we like. We're God's chosen people. He'll love us anyway. God can't be angry with us. Yet for those who were willing to listen, they'd soon see how wrong they were. Chapter 3, verse 8, God says he will declare his people's transgressions. In chapter 6, verse 2, very sobering, he says he will make a case against his people. He will lodge a charge against Israel. And as we read through the book of Micah, we see what that charge is. He says, I asked you to act justly, but you've despised justice and distorted all that is right. Chapter 3, verse 9. I asked you to love mercy, but you've just been selfish and used people for your own ends. Chapter 2. Verses 1 and 2. I asked you to walk humbly before me as your God, but you've, you've turned to idols. And you've taken other people with you. Chapter 3, verse 5. Well, that was then, in the day of Micah, but this is now. In Micah 6, verse 12, it speaks of the violence of rich men. Today, around the world, we're told that around 2 million children are exploited in their commercial sex industry, two million. In Micah chapter 2, verse 2, people take possessions and homes from others simply because they are powerful enough to do so. Today around the world, we're told that more than 45 million men, women, and children are held in modern-day slavery. 
In Micah chapter 3, verse 9, God's people have been given a message to share, but they fail to share it. Today, around the world, 80% of Muslims, Buddhists, and Hindus have no Christian friend. Their lack of access to the gospel is a grave injustice. And this isn't just a challenge, is it, for people out there, somewhere out there in a generic sense. If we look close to home, well, what, do we, what do we see? What do we feel? We love the idea of justice, don't we? We love it. We love the idea of justice. We value it. Yet isn't it true too often we turn a blind eye when it's others who are facing the injustice? We love the idea of mercy. Yet I wonder, aren't we all too happy sometimes to be mean to the person working all hours for little pay in the factory in Bangladesh if it means we can get cheap clothes in the shops here in England? We love the idea, the concept of walking humbly before our God. But isn't it true, so often we're way too keen to show the world around us just how self-sufficient and able we are to make ourselves look good. God said to his people in the day of Micah, there were consequences if they went on living in that way. Micah 3 verse 4, then they will cry out to the Lord, but he will not answer them. At that time he will hide his face from them because of the evil they have done. Friends, God is serious about our sin, isn't he? He sees our lack of justice and our lack of mercy and our lack of walking humbly with him and he witnesses against it. He makes a case against us and if nothing changes, we face his judgment because of it. What does God want? He wants us to listen to him. He wants us to act justly, to love mercy to walk humbly before him. Yet, friends, we've got to ask the question, what have we done? So what's the remedy? What's the remedy? Well, some will say we just need a bit more of Micah chapter 6, verse 8 in our lives. We just need to try harder to act justly. We need to try harder to, to love mercy. We need to try harder to walk humbly before our God. Maybe we can do a better job of it, and maybe we'll be okay in the end. But if that's the road we go down, friends, we just end up in some horrible cycle. We end up like hamsters in a wheel. We, we, we do a bit more, we try harder, then we mess it up again. So we do a bit more and we try harder, and we, we mess it up again. So we do a bit more and we try harder. And you see how it goes and we go round and we go round and we go round. It's like all of the religions out there. Our way back to God becomes dependent on us. The end of our separation from God dependent on us, the removal of God's anger and judgment that hangs over us, dependent on us. And it is also utterly, utterly hopeless. Because there is nothing we can do to put this right on our own. Friends, we need something more. We need something to break us out of that cycle. We need some help to live the life that we ought to live. Which brings us thirdly to the question, what has God achieved? What does God want? What have we done? Thirdly, what has God achieved? Maybe you could sum up the message of the book of Micah like this. What God wants, we haven't given to him. Yet what we need, he has given to us. What God wants, we haven't given to him. Yet what we need, he has given to us. Come with me to chapter 5 and verse 2. Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, an incredible, wonderful prophecy. Maybe we'll hear it in seven weeks' time as we head towards Christmas. In chapter 5, verse 2, God promises a new ruler. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Here's someone who's going to come from Bethlehem. No prizes we're guessing, we're talking here about the Lord Jesus. He will come for me, it says. That is, he is God's appointed one. What will he do when he comes? We're told he will rule over Israel. Notice the contrast with the leaders in the day of Micah. We're told in the book of Micah they cared nothing for God's people. They led them into idolatry. They caused them to sin. They left them without hope. They took advantage of the people. Yet God's ruler will come, chapter 5, verse 4, and he will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God. See, God's ruler will be the good shepherd 
who will come to lay down his life for the sheep. That great sacrifice anticipated is clear again here in, in our passage. In Micah 5 verse 5 where it goes on to say, And he will be our peace. It's echoed, isn't it, in Ephesians 2 that we're reading part of it earlier on. For he himself is our peace. Speaking of the impact of Jesus' death on the cross. We know, don't we, by dying on the cross, Jesus took upon himself the right anger of God for our sin. And not only that, he gave us his right standing with God. The one who knew no sin, the one who always did act justly, who always did love mercy, who always did walk humbly with God his Father, he became sin for us. The results we see at the end of verse 4, and they will live securely. For then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. If the people in the day of Micah would only listen to the Lord and turn from their sin and return to him. The prophet is saying to them, look, you'll have no more threats from your enemies. No more danger of being taken into exile. And for us today, if we're believing in Jesus, we have the great promise that there will be no condemnation. We will live securely for eternity. This is grace, isn't it? This is undeserved mercy. You're not going to find a message like this anywhere else. Just flick over to Micah 7, verses 18 to 19, and see how Micah finishes his prophecy. Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl our iniquities into the depths of the sea. What God wants, we haven't given to him, yet what we need, friends, he's given to us. Here is a God full of compassion who delights to show mercy. It means if you turn from your sin and put your trust in the Lord Jesus, he will pardon your sins, he will forgive your transgressions, he will hurl your iniquities into the depths of the sea. Guilt is removed, condemnation gone forever. Friend, I hope you believe it. Do you believe it? Maybe you're sitting there thinking, sounds a bit too good to be true. Can it really work like that? Don't deserve that. Maybe you're sitting there thinking, you don't know what I'm really like. You don't know what I've really done. Isn't there someone else who one day will pop up, who will appear and keep on accusing me of the things that I know I've done wrong? Well, come with me to chapter 7 and verse 9. The scene, if you like, is the courtroom. We all love those films, don't we? And here's this justice thing we talked about at the beginning a few moments ago. We love those films that have the epic courtroom finish. In those scenes, we hear the case for the prosecution. Strong, striking. Things aren't looking too good for the person who's been accused. But then there's the stirring case for the defense. And the innocent person is free. Justice is served. And we think, amazing. We all feel very happy at the end of our evening watching the film. Yet here we are in the courtroom, to use that analogy, and we fear what's coming. We know from chapter 6, verse 2, that God has a case to make against us. He knows our hearts. He knows, that we've, he knows what we've done. And there is not one clever lawyer, even in all of Hollywood, who could plead our case with success. We know it. Beginning of chapter 7 and verse 9, what does it say? Because I have sinned against him, I will bear the Lord's wrath. We're guilty. The verdict is what we deserve. And yet in a moment way more dramatic than the movies, what happens in chapter 7, verse 9, Jesus Christ stands up in that courtroom and he pleads, my case. Chapter 7, verse 9, what what does it say next? Because I have sinned against him, I will bear the Lord's wrath until he pleads my case and upholds my cause. He will bring me out into the light. I will see his righteousness. Friends, isn't that incredible? As we stand accused in that court before a God we've sinned against, the Lord Jesus stands for us in our place and he pleads, he pleads our case before our Father in heaven. He pleads our case because he's taken our sin. Friends, this is the gospel. It's good news, isn't it? Good news. God loves us. 
and he treats us in ways we do not deserve. What God wants, we haven't given to him yet. What we need, he has given to us. Let's read again, chapter 7, verses 18 and 19. Who is a God like you, who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. Praise God. What does God want? What what have we done? What has God achieved? Fourthly, a few concluding thoughts on justice and mercy. Let's go back to where we started. Micah chapter 6, verse 8. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. We've seen and we know, don't we, if we're honest, we've so often failed to live up to those stirring words. So is that it then? Do these words not matter so much? Do these concepts, these principles not matter so much for us as Christians because, well, praise God, through Jesus, he has pardoned our sin. He has forgiven our transgression. He has thrown our iniquities into the depths of the sea. Therefore, can we excuse ourselves for for not focusing on these issues of justice? and mercy, and humble living. Well, not at all. These things matter for Christian people for two big reasons. They matter. First, because of Jesus, we can live this way. Because of Jesus, we can live this way. Yes, of course, a Christian will always have to battle against sin. If we claim we're without sin, then we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 1 John chapter 1, verse 10. We're not always going to get it right when it comes to justice and mercy and humble living. Yet at the same time, the Christian is no longer a slave to sin. We've been set free from sin and we are now slaves to righteousness, to right living. Romans chapter 6 verse 18, which means that whilst we often will still get these things wrong, as Christian people who have believed in the Lord Jesus, if that is us this afternoon, we are free to choose justice over selfishness. We are free to choose mercy over oppression. We're free to walk humbly with our God. So there's one big reason why we should listen to this call from God in Micah 6 verse 8. Because of Jesus, we can live this way. Second thing to say is this. Because of Jesus, not only can we live this way, we should live this way. As you read the book of Micah, you see that what God asks of us here in chapter 6, verse 8, is simply a reflection of his own character. Isn't that true? Our God has a passion for justice. He never leaves sin unpunished, chapter 1, verse 3. He never looks away when the needy are oppressed, chapter 6, verse 12. And when it comes to mercy, well, what have we already seen? Chapter 7, verse 18, he delights to show mercy. He shows it even to sinful people like us and he does so at the greatest part. The death of his only son, the Lord Jesus. Friends, this is the character of our God. These things matter to him. Acting justly, loving mercy. They're not just some niche activities for a few keen Christians to get interested in. No, this is, this is mainstream. This is the normal Christian life for those of us who are following the Lord Jesus. 1 John 2 verse 6 says, whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Friends, we have received generous justice, delights, filled mercy. And the God who's treated us in these kinds of ways, he says to us, act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. I wonder how this might work out in our lives. Well, praise God for all the ways it already is across the church family here. But maybe a few questions for you to take away and ponder later on this afternoon or this evening as you reflect on some of the themes of our time together today. Here are three questions to ponder. One, who might we show mercy to during this second lockdown as it begins on Thursday? Two, 
Who is suffering some kind of injustice in our community? And how might we help them? Three. Who might we be taking advantage of, whether close to home or far away, just because we can? It's striking in my group, isn't it, the situation where people are having their property taken from them. What's the reason given for the motivation? Why did the people in the day of Micah do that to other people? The answer is just because they could. Because they were in that position of authority. So there's that third question. It's pretty challenging. It gets close to the bone, doesn't it? Who might we be taking advantage of, whether close to home or far away, just because we can? And how might we change as a result? If you want to explore some more of these issues about justice and mercy, you want to check out websites of groups like the International Justice Mission, or ministries of groups like Compassion or Caring for Life, some people in our church family involved in some of those ministries too. You can Google some of those later if they're new to you and just chew it over, talk to people about some of these things. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Friends, if we're Christian people this afternoon, because of Jesus, this is what we can do. We can live this way. And because of Jesus, this is what we must do. Let's pray together. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we we give you great praise that even though we have not been able to do what you've asked of us, we praise that you have done for us what we need. Father, we thank you so much for such generous mercy, undeserved. We thank you for these great promises of guilt removed and of our sins hurled into the bottom of the sea if we turn from our sin and put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that uh, as, we, as we do that, as we are made uh, new creations where the old has gone and the new has come, Father, please help us to live the freedom that we have to, to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly before you. Help us, we pray, as we, as we work out what this means in our lives. We praise you for the ways these, these characteristics are manifested across our church family and for the many people who are served in these ways because of it. We pray to you, we go on challenging us and changing us about other areas of our lives where we need to uh, uh, rethink and refocus that we would reflect something of your character in the way we treat other people and live before you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.